The first great principle of success in life is the principle of purpose, and the establishment of a clear central purpose or goal in life is the starting point of all success. That every single study that we've ever read, and every study of self-made millionaires, high-achieving men and women, Olympic athletes, we find that their upward trajectory in life begins with the establishment of a clear central purpose, something that they want to do with a burning desire, something that is so important to them that they develop the motivation and the momentum to overcome all resistance. Mr. H. L. Hunt, the great oil billionaire, who was a bankrupt cotton farmer in Arkansas at the age of 32 in the middle of the Depression, and who at the age of 56 was earning $3 million a day, and the age of 76, shortly before he died, was earning $5 million a day, was on a television show. And the moderator asked him, Mr. Hunt, you've been so successful in your life. Could you give our viewers some ideas on how they could be more successful too? And he thought for a second, and he replied, he said, I've known thousands of men and women, he said. He said, and I own or control hundreds of companies. He said, and there's only two things necessary for success. He said, the first thing is that you have to decide exactly what it is you want. He said, that's the starting point. And he said in his estimation that most people in life never decide exactly what they want. Most people wander through life wanting a whole lot of things, wanting nothing particularly well, and ending up settling for far less than they're capable of. He said the second thing, he said that even if people do decide exactly what it is they want, he said the second thing is that you have to determine the price you're going to have to pay to get it, and then resolve to pay that price. He said that most people never get to that second stage, and they don't realize that there's a price that always has to be paid for success. And he said that's all that you have to do. And he said he was bankrupt at the age of 32 when he learned those two principles, is determine exactly what you want and determine the price you're going to have to pay. Establish a clear central purpose for your life, and it is the starting point of all great success. However, each of us is engineered for success in that we are built as the result of a billion years of evolution. We have a mind that is so complex and so wonderful that it can do things that no human computer will ever be able to do, and we are engineered to achieve great success with our lives. However, we're programmed for failure in that we continually seek the fast, easy way through life. And the fast, easy way through life inevitably ends with failure and underachievement. Doing the fast, easy thing to get the things that we want now inevitably leads to secondary consequences which are far worse than we had intended, as we've talked about before. It's as though we have a success mechanism and a failure mechanism built into us. The failure mechanism, expedient behavior, goes off automatically and continuously, which explains why most people fail in that they are programmed to fail. Your success mechanism, however, is activated or triggered by a goal. As soon as you determine upon a goal something that you really, really want, you override your failure mechanism and begin freeing yourself from the gravitational pull of the E-factor. Now, this is critical. You will go around in circles or drift like a ship without a rudder, back and forth with the tide, or go down the road of life like an automobile with no steering wheel, until you set upon a goal. And once you decide upon a goal, everything else changes for you. Decisiveness is critical. All winners are decisive. All losers are indecisive. You must make a clear decision about what it is you really want in life. Failure to plan means planning to fail. Your subconscious mind is activated by a goal. When you decide upon a clear purpose for your life, you trigger a cybernetic goal-seeking function in your brain that begins to move you toward it and it toward you. A good friend of mine told me that there are only two creatures in the universe that have this particular function, and the other creature is the homing pigeon. You can take a homing pigeon and you can put it in a box and cover it with a blanket and put it in a sealed truck and drive it a thousand miles from home and then open up the truck and take off the blanket and open up the box and open the cage and throw the homing pigeon up into the sky. And the homing pigeon will circle three times and then head straight for home in exactly the right direction. Your brain has the same mechanism that is in the brain of the homing pigeon. That when you program a goal into your brain, you immediately set up a type of vibration that goes out from you and radiates out from you and it begins to attract into your life the people, circumstances, and opportunities that enable you to accomplish it. But if you do not have a clear goal or set of goals, and if you do not have plans to work toward those goals, then this mechanism doesn't work at all. It lays dormant within your brain. My wife has a idiot-proof camera. It's called a Canon SureShot. This camera is automatic. It uh, runs the film forward. It runs it back. It uh, tells you when you need a flash. It uh, adjusts the focus automatically. And it's a simple camera, and she can take 24 out of 24, 36 out of 36 excellent photographs. 
I also have a friend who's a professional photographer, and he has a Hasselblad camera, one of the finest cameras in the world. His total kit with the camera is worth about $10,000. He can photograph a microbe in a raindrop at 50 feet with that beautiful lens, which is about three and a half inches across. Absolutely beautiful camera. However, my wife can take better photographs with her Canon Sure Shot than my friend with his Hasselblad camera all day long if my friend with a Hasselblad camera is not allowed to do one thing. And the one thing is if he is not allowed to focus his camera. You see, he can have the finest camera in the world, but if he's not allowed to focus it, it won't do him any good. Every shot he gets will be blurred and out of focus. If you understand this principle, it's critical. An average person with average talents and abilities and average education can outstrip the most brilliant genius in our society if that average person has clear, focused goals, and if the genius does not. So this is critical. And that's why you see men and women who start from virtually nothing and they make wonderful uh, progress in their lives and almost invariably you see it starts with a goal. Some people don't set a goal till they're 30, some till they're 40, some till they're 50, some people never do. But it's important to understand this, that without goals you are doomed forever to work for people who do. That without goals you will never fulfill your potential. And that your ability to set goals and to make plans for their accomplishment is the master skill of success. It's the most important single skill that you can ever learn. It's more important than what you learn in schools. It's more important than any technical knowledge that you'll ever have. I'm not saying that this is easy. Making decisions and setting goals is hard work. And that's why only winners have goals. Losers are lazy. They won't take the time and effort to think through what they really want and then make plans for its accomplishment. Now, what do you want? Have you ever decided that? What exactly do you want? How much do you want to earn? Have you decided how much you want to earn this year, next year, the year after, five years from now, ten years from now? All top performers in every field have a very good idea of where they're going to be financially in the years to come. What kind of a job do you want? Take a look at your job today and ask yourself, is this the kind of job that you want to have for the rest of your life? And if it's not, what is the kind of job that you want? Remember, you can have anything you want if you can clearly define it, but you can't hit a target that you can't see. Where do you want to be in one, two, three, four, five years? Where do you want to be next year and the year after and the year after? What sort of progress do you want to make? What kind of lifestyle do you want to have? What level of health do you want to have? What kind of relationships do you want? Most of all, how badly do you want them? How badly do you want these things? Because that's going to determine more than anything else whether or not you accomplish them. You see, you can have anything you want in life if you want it badly enough and are willing to pay the price. If you want it badly enough and are willing to pay the price. Now, the rules regarding the price of success are simple. There's just two of them. Number one is you always have to pay full price for success. And number two is you always have to pay in advance. Now, here are some key points on goals. And please remember these. The first key point is that your ability to set goals and to make plans for their accomplishment is the master skill of success. The development of this skill requires continual practice and serious personal work something that only the top 5% will discipline themselves to do. You see, setting goals is hard. Setting goals requires delaying gratification. Setting goals means taking some time aside and sitting down and really thinking through what it is you want in each area of your life. And because this is difficult, most people won't do it. Number two, your goals must be congruent with your basic values. Your self-esteem comes from engaging in activities and working toward goals that are consistent with what you believe to be good and right and important. Take some time to think through what you believe in and then structure your goals in harmony with your innermost convictions. What are your basic values in life? What would you live for? What would you fight for? What would you sacrifice for? What would you die for? What are the most important things to you in life? And are your goals, are your daily activities congruent with those values? One of the things that I've found is that if you're in a job that is right for you, that you will feel good about it. And if you're in a job that's wrong for you, you will feel uncomfortable about it and demotivated. Now, one of the things that I found when I was younger is that sometimes I'd be in a job that I hated, and yet everybody around me thought it was a great job. And the reason for that, as I learned, is that for them and their values, it was the ideal job. But for me, and in many cases for you and your values, it was the wrong job. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if you are not happy or content in your job, if you're not excited or fulfilled in your job, then you should get out of it, and you should get out of it quickly, because it is the surest way to fail in life is to stay at a job that you're not right for, especially a job that is incongruent or inconsistent with your basic values. 
Now, one of the things we know about high-achieving men and women is that they're very clear about what it is they believe in. And one of the things that we know about underachievers and failures is that they're very vague about what it is they believe in. Because when you know what your values are, then it's quite easy for you to make the critical decisions in your life. But if you don't know what your values are, or if you've never taken the time to think them through, then you will toss with the wind and you'll go whichever way the wind blows on almost any area of decision. Number three, your goals must be in writing. You should describe them in clear, specific, vivid language, in every detail, as though you were ordering something to be manufactured for you on the other side of the country. Writing down your goals programs them into the subconscious mind. Now, I have arguments with people at my seminars all the time. They say, well, I don't need to write my goals because I know what they are. And this, to me, is the mark of the true loser. Because if you cannot write your goals down clearly and describe them, it means one of two things. Either you don't know what they are, or you are not committed to accomplishing them. I have found that many people fear failure, and because they fear failure, they never write the goals down, because then they can't be accused of having failed. So if you don't have your goals in writing, the very next thing you should do after listening to this tape is sit down, take a pad of paper, and write out everything that you want to accomplish in the next three to five years. Write it out as though you had no limitation at all. Many people have had the experience of sitting down on New Year's Eve and writing out their goals for the next year and then putting the goals away for 12 months and opening them up on December 31st and finding that 80% of those goals have been accomplished. Just writing the goals down once programs them into the subconscious mind. Now, here's a suggestion which I give you, and it is worth the entire time that you spend listening to this course. It is to take and rewrite your major goals every single morning. Take and rewrite your major single goals every single morning. Just as though if you were traveling, you would take a look at your road map every single morning before you started out. Sit down and rewrite your major goals. Write them down briefly and write them down as though they were already accomplished. I earn $30,000 a year. I weigh 175 pounds. I am an excellent salesperson or whatever your goal or objective is. But write it out in the present tense as though it were already accomplished. And every time you write it down, you reprogram it into the subconscious mind. If you will do that for the next 30 days, you will make more progress in the next 30 days than you made in the last six months. You will be astonished. And the reason why this works is that every time you write it down, you increase the intensity of vibration going out of your mind into the world. And this law of attraction will then attract back into your life people and circumstances that will assist you to accomplish those goals. And as you write and rewrite the goals, you will find that your description of your major goals changes. And it changes and becomes sharper and clearer and more vivid. And sometimes the goals that you wrote down at the beginning of the month and the goals that you're now writing down at the end of the month will be completely different. But the goals at the end of the month will be the real goals, the really important goals in your life. Fourth point in goal setting, you must have a major definite purpose, one goal that is more important than any other. You can have many different goals, but you must have one goal, which is number one. And many people ask me this question. They say, Brian, well, can I have two major definite purposes? And the answer to that is no. There's a line in the Bible that says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And what it means is if you try to do two things at once, or you have two goals with equal priority, you will end up doing neither and doing neither of them very well. The way you choose your major definite purpose is once you've listed all your goals, you ask yourself, which is the one goal, the accomplishment of which would move me more rapidly toward the accomplishment of all my other goals than anyone on this list? Pick the one goal. Now, when we're younger, often our goals are financial. Uh, sometimes they have to do with our careers. Sometimes they have to do with health or our relationships. But whichever goal would have the greatest positive impact on every other area of your life, set that as your major definite purpose. Now, it can be a one-year major definite purpose. It can be a 10-year major definite purpose. But it must be your major definite purpose. So if somebody woke you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, what's your major definite purpose in life? You would wake up and be able to tell them without even thinking. The failure to select a major definite purpose and to make plans for its accomplishment leads to aimlessness and drift and unhappiness and confusion and low self-esteem. Remember, your major definite purpose must be measurable. You can have a variety of different goals, but your major definite purpose, your number one goal, must be measurable. You must be able to quantify it. There's a beautiful line that says, what gets measured gets done. And if you cannot measure your goal, then it is probably not an ideal goal for a major definite purpose. For instance, you could have a goal to be happy, but that couldn't be your major definite purpose. You could have a goal for weight loss, and that's a measurable goal. You can have a goal for income increase, and that is a measurable goal. So make sure your goals are measurable. Make sure your goals are challenging and believable and achievable. 
Make sure that your goals are just slightly beyond anything that you've done before so that it makes you stretch, and especially your major definite purpose. But each of your goals should be something beyond anything you've accomplished. You see, it's goals that keep us out of the comfort zone. It's goals that stop us from getting into a rut. It's goals that guarantee that we continue to grow and expand our capacities in life. And finally, under number four, you must know why you want to achieve your goal. How will you benefit personally? Why do you want it in the first place? You see, we found that if there's one or two reasons for achieving a goal, you'll have a little bit of motivation. If you have five or ten reasons, you'll have more motivation. But if you have 50 reasons for achieving a particular goal, you'll have so much motivation that nothing will be able to stop you. Jim Rohn says it very well. He said people have no lack of goals. What they have is a lack of reasons. And we've seen this over and over again. Everybody wants to be rich, but if you ask why do you want to be rich, most people haven't the slightest idea. Most people say, if I was rich, I could quit working. Of course, which is why they never become rich. Okay, point number five. If you don't have a major definite purpose, make it your number one goal to find your major definite purpose. If you look for it, you will find it. In the Bible it says, seek and ye shall find. It doesn't say seek and occasionally you'll find something. It says, seek and ye shall find. And many people start off without a major definite purpose. As a matter of fact, 95% of the population hasn't the slightest idea what the central purpose is of their lives. So if you start off and you don't have a major definite purpose, don't worry about it. It means that you're exactly the same as everybody else, but set it as your major goal to find it. And keep persisting, keep thinking, keep reflecting, keep reviewing what it is that you could be your major definite purpose, and I promise you, you will find it. And when you find it, it's like your whole life goes into overdrive. Make it the most important single goal of your life to find out what it is that you should be doing. Point number six, make detailed plans to achieve your goals and break your plans down into monthly, weekly, and daily activities. Always define your goals in terms of the activities you will have to engage in to achieve them. Do something extra every day to move you towards your most important goals. Remember, daily progress boosts self-esteem and self-confidence. The true winning feeling comes from that sensation that we are making progress every single day toward accomplishing something that is important to us. Number seven, remember this. Goal setting is the process of moving from where you are to where you want to be. It is simple, straightforward, and effective. The more you practice setting clear goals, the better you get. When you become an expert at setting goals and making plans, your success is assured. Look upon a goal as a blueprint. Now, even a master builder, the finest craftsman that you could find, with the finest materials and the finest piece of land in the city, could not build you a good home without a blueprint. But even an average craftsman, if he had a good enough plan, could build you an excellent home. So even if you are a brilliant human being, extremely intelligent, very capable and talented, without a goal, you will not be able to construct a great life. And as I said before, you will have to spend the rest of your life working for people who have clear, specific goals and clear blueprints for their life. And over again, even some of the most impossible goals you can imagine start to become real and become alive for you. Remember, the more you repeat them, the more you think about them, the more you visualize them, the more rapidly you come to believe that you are capable of accomplishing them. And once you believe that you are capable of accomplishing them, nothing in the world can stop you. Remember, goal-centered living is a source of energy and enthusiasm. It's not possible to be motivated without goals. Occasionally I'm on radio programs and people call in and they say, well, how can I get myself motivated? And I say, what are your goals? And they say, I don't know. And I say, well, that's the reason why you're not motivated. You see, we're always motivated when there is something that we want badly enough. You could take the laziest, dopiest, most hopeless human being that you ever saw, the most demotivated creature that you could ever imagine, and take them about 50 feet offshore in a lake and drop them out of a boat and put your hand on their head and hold their head underwater. And I'll guarantee you that within a few seconds, you'll see the most excited, the most enthusiastic, the most motivated person you could possibly imagine. Why? It's because finally there's something that the individual wants badly enough. And when there's something that you want badly enough, you will have the excitement, the motivation, the enthusiasm, and the energy that will drive you toward accomplishing it. Every step you take towards your goal gives you a feeling of accomplishment, that winning feeling that boosts your self-esteem and improves your performance. You see, this is why all winners are goal-centered. Because each time you take a step toward accomplishing something that's important to you, you feel like a winner. Each time you feel like a winner, your self-esteem goes up. Each time your self-esteem goes up and you like yourself better, you feel energy and enthusiasm that causes you to try more things, to try other things, to hurl yourself 
into achieving more of the goals that are possible for you. Goals are the fuel in the furnace of achievement. The more goals you have, the more excited you are about life, the more progress you make. Imagine that you are a, like a steam engine, and as a steam engine is motivated or driven by fuel in the furnace, the more goals you have, the more excited and positive and driven you become. Remember, happiness is the progressive realization of a worthy goal. It is the key to a positive mental attitude. A major reason for failure, unhappiness, and frustration is a lack of meaning and purpose in life. In my estimation, 80-90% of the people who are in hospitals and clinics in America are there because they have no sense of meaning and purpose in life. In my estimation, most of the unhappiness in our society comes from people who do not know where they're going. And because they lack that sense of inner worth, that sense of central purpose, they become angry and frustrated and alienated and hostile, and they take it out in drugs and alcohol and negativity, uh, and so on, and so on. But if you force yourself to think only about what you want for just 21 days, the same period of time that it takes for a chicken to hatch an egg, if you force yourself to think about it for only 21 days, you will lay down a new positive habit pattern that will stay with you throughout the rest of your life. You can actually change your personality from whatever it is to being a positive, optimistic, cheerful, excited, motivated, enthusiastic person just by thinking about your goals continuously for 21 days. Well, what have we learned? Number one, and we've beaten this to death, setting clear, specific goals, writing them down, and making step-by-step -step plans for their accomplishment is essential to your success. This is hard work, which is why losers don't do it. Instead, they drift aimlessly, confused and unhappy. You must discipline yourself to be intensely goal-oriented if you want to be successful. Success is tons of discipline. Number two, decisiveness. Deciding exactly what it is you want in life is the starting point of all achievement. The positive habit of decisiveness gives courage, clarity and force to your personality. Number three, self-esteem, the key to success and peak performance, comes from setting goals consistent with your values. That winning feeling which comes from making a measurable progress toward goals that are important to you. Number four, your subconscious mind is activated by goals in the form of clear mental pictures and positive affirmations. Visualize your ideal goal complete in every detail. See it as though it existed already. Speak about your goal to yourself in positive affirmative language. I earned $30,000 per annum. I can do it. I feel terrific. I am excellent at my work. Say this over and over again. Number five, read and review your goals and plans every day. Take 30 minutes each day to think and reflect upon your goals, always seeking newer, better, more creative ways of achieving them. In fact, you will find that the 30 minutes that you take at the beginning of each day to think about your goals, to reflect on what you're doing and how you could do it better, to revise your goals, to fit in with new information, will be the most valuable 30 minutes that you ever spend. All great achievers, in almost all the biographies and autobiographies you'll ever read, you'll find that people begin to become great when they begin to spend time by themselves each day thinking about who they are. And most people, in their eagerness to get out of the house and listen to the radio and get off to work and do what is fun and easy, don't discipline themselves to sit down and think through what they're doing. And that's why they make so many mistakes and so little progress. The surest way to overcome fears of failure, self-doubt, and lack of confidence is to make daily progress towards your major goals. Remember, nothing succeeds like success. We all have fears of failure. We all are afraid of risk. We're all afraid of loss. But we have to make a habit of confronting those fears of failure and moving forward. And even one little step minimizes the feeling of failure and increases the feeling of excitement. Nothing succeeds like success. That is why successful people are those who make a habit of success. They start from the same background of limitation and underachievement that everybody else starts from, but then they make a habit of succeeding. So it reaches the point that no matter what happens in their external world, whether their companies go broke or the economy changes or they lose all of their money, once they've made a mental habit of success, they can always repeat it. Your most vital task is to learn how to set and achieve one major goal. Now, this is critically important. If you sit down, determine your major definite purpose, make a plan for its accomplishment, and then go to work on achieving that one goal. What you need is one major accomplishment, one accomplishment of something that is really important to you. Once you've done that, this success will be accepted by your subconscious mind as a success pattern, 
a habit of success, and you will have programmed yourself to repeat it. This is why successful people go from one success to the other. They've programmed their subconscious mind with a success pattern, and then the subconscious drives them almost without conscious effort. Your subconscious will work to make your words and actions fit a pattern consistent with your previous success. That's why nothing succeeds like success. This is the key. Learn to succeed by succeeding and laying down a habit of success, which can only be accomplished by achieving challenging, worthwhile goals. Remember, write your goals down. Organize them in order of priority. Select your major definite purpose. Make a plan for its accomplishment. Define the plan in terms of activities and get to work right today and do something extra every day to move you towards your goal. And your success is virtually assured. Made the decision to do something that they enjoyed doing. And as a result of doing something they enjoyed doing, they became very good at it. And becoming very good at it, they were eventually paid very well. They became totally absorbed in their work. As a matter of fact, they became so totally absorbed in what they were doing that they were not even aware that they became millionaires in most cases. The money and the wealth just simply accumulated over the course of that 20 years. Specialization and total absorption in their work was the key. In addition, they were not gamblers or risk takers. Once they earned the money, they invested it carefully and let it accumulate. One day they woke up and found that their net worths were over $1 million. Now, this is very important. They held on to their money. They saved it. First of all, they chose a field they enjoyed. Second of all, they became good at it. Third of all, they were paid very well. And fourth of all, they held on to the money. They did not invest in get-rich-quick schemes. They did not try to double their money quickly. Recently, Dr. Blotnick followed up his study to find out what would be the best strategy once a person had made a million dollars to make the second million. And he found that the very best way to make your second million was to go on doing exactly what you had been doing to make your first million. But if you started to play it safe or you started to get into something that you didn't know, that you hadn't specialized in, it was the surest way to lose everything that you had earned. Now, the famous Pareto Principle says that 80% of your results will come from 20% of your activities. In sales, especially, the rule says that 80% of the sales will come from 20% of the salespeople. That means that 20% of the sales come from 80% of the salespeople. In my experience, the top 20% in sales, and I've worked with thousands of the top salespeople in America, those top 20% are always people who have made a conscious decision to become excellent in the field of selling. If they did not suddenly stumble in to being in the top 20%. It was not an accident. They made a very clear, conscious decision well in advance when they started their sales career that they were going to become very, very good at what they were doing. And that conscious decision is what put them in the top 20%. Small marginal differences in competence translate into enormous differences in results. Prudential Insurance Company did a study of their thousands of agents a few years ago and found out that the 80-20 rule held true over wide geographic areas. 80% of their sales were coming from 20% of their salespeople. Now, when they sat down and they looked at the figures and the statistics, they ran them through the computer and found that this worked out that the top 20% were earning, on average, 16 times that of the bottom 80%. So they decided to carry the study a little bit further, and they compared the average income of the top 20% of the top 20%, which is the top 4%, and they found that the average income of the top 4% was 32 times the average income of those in the bottom 80%. So they took the study a little bit further, and they took the top 20% of the top 20% of the top 20%, which is the top 0.8%, and they found that the top 0.8% were earning, on average, 54 times that of the average of the bottom 80%. Same product, same market, same price, same competition, and in each state there was at least one adult agent who was earning more than 50 other full-time adult agents. In every case, the top people had made a decision a long time ago to be the best. Were the people in the top 20% 16 times better than the people in the bottom 80%? Were they 16 times faster, 16 times more experienced? Did they work 16 times harder? What about the people in the top 4%? Were they 32 times smarter? Did they work 32 times harder? No. In every single case, the difference that translated into enormous differences in income was just slight marginal edges, slight tiny differences in competence. And that's all that it takes. The top 20% in every field are just a little tiny bit better in certain areas than the bottom 80%. Now remember this, anything less than a commitment to excellence 
is an acceptance of mediocrity. People don't realize that, but unless you make the conscious commitment that you're going to become very good at what you do, what you are unconsciously accepting is that you are only going to be mediocre. The top 20% in every field prosper in good times and bad. Excellence is the key to lifelong economic security. Now, this is an important point because, in my experience, at least 80% of the population worries about money all the time. They worry about money in the morning, and they think about money all day, and they talk about money in the evenings, and they worry about it on the weekends. Perhaps the only times that they don't worry about money is sometimes on their holidays or sometimes when they're drinking. But almost everybody worries about money all the time. However, if you join the top 20%, you never have to worry about money again, because you will never be unemployed. No matter what happens to the economy, the top 20% in every field are always working, and employers are always seeking out the top 20%. That if you make the decision to become excellent at what you do, you have lifelong economic security, that you don't have to worry about money. From then, you'll only then have to worry about how much you earn and, of course, how much taxes you pay. Remember, instead of trying to be hundreds of percent better in one area, concentrate on just being one or two percent better in hundreds of areas. This is the key to excellence. This is the key to high achievement. Now, the same principles of excellence hold true for companies as for individuals. Twenty percent of the companies earn eighty percent of the profits in every industry. They do this by developing an area of excellence, a competitive advantage that causes them to stand out from their competition. A perfect example is IBM. Now, if you talk to IBM people or if you look at IBM advertising, you'll find one point which has been made over and over for over 60 years. It's simply this, is that IBM means service. You know that if you buy a product from IBM that you're going to get the best service in the world. And many people will pay far more for an IBM product that does exactly the same thing as another product because of the security that they have knowing if they buy from IBM that IBM will take care of them. In other words, IBM has developed an area of excellence. The area of excellence is that nobody will compete with them on service. And that is the key perception in the minds of the millions of people who buy their products and sometimes pay more for their products uh, throughout the world every year. Every single company has to have a competitive advantage that enables them to stand out from their competition. The market will always pay extra for quality. You see, when we go to buy something in the market, we always buy it because we think it is the very best product for our purposes at that time. And any product and any company that does not stand out from its competition in some way is going to fail in the marketplace. What is yours? What is your area of excellence? What is your competitive advantage as a person? What is the competitive advantage or area of excellence of your business? What could it be? What should it be? If you do not know that you are good at something, you will never like and respect and accept yourself. And people who know that they are not really good at anything feel uneasy and insecure and inferior in the presence of people who know they are good at what they do. Now, it's not difficult to achieve excellence in your chosen field if you will do the following. Number one, make a decision right now, today, to commit yourself to becoming excellent at something. Set it as a top priority goal. Number two, Remember, you will only be able to achieve excellence doing something that you love to do, something you care about, something that interests you and holds your attention. A key responsibility of adult life is to find the right field for your unique gifts. Here are some questions. How would you describe your ideal job? If you could have any job in the world, what job would it be? How would you describe it? Imagine a billionaire was willing to give you any job that you wanted in the whole world. What would it be? Here's another question. What work would you choose to do if you won a million dollars in the lottery? What work would you choose to do if you won a million dollars in the lottery? And here's another question. What would you choose to do with your time if you only had six months to live? How would you spend your time? And here's another. What job would you select if you were absolutely guaranteed of success? What job would you select to prepare yourself for, to work toward, to set as your ideal or as your goal and work toward if you could be absolutely guaranteed of success in that job. Now, the purpose of these questions is to stimulate your thinking. Remember, you can have or be or do almost anything you want in life if you can decide what it is. And one of the things that you have to decide is what is going to be your area of excellence. You see, if you can find what you love to do, you almost invariably find that you will love to do something that you're good at. And if you can find what you love to do and what you're good at and what you care about and what interests you, 
you'll get one of the greatest bursts of joy and satisfaction in the world. Your work will become your play. Your choice of the right job for you is one of life's critical decisions. But until you find the work you are meant to do, you'll never be happy, you'll never be satisfied, you'll never be really successful. Remember, you are put on this earth to do something remarkable, something unique. God does not play dice with the human race. Nobody on this earth is extra or redundant for any reason. You're here for a specific purpose, and you're here to find your area of excellence and to throw your whole heart into it and to become very, very good. And it's in doing that that you will make your great contribution on this earth. Number three, once you've chosen your field, spend one hour per day in study to become better. This is so simple that it's devastating, but it's all you need to do. One hour per day in any field will put you in the top 5% in two to three years. I've made this claim in other places. I've told salespeople that if they will spend one hour every morning reading and studying in sales, and if they will listen to tapes on sales in their cars when they're driving around, that they will double their income in 90 days. And I've had people come back to me and say that very simple system of reading 30 to 60 minutes each morning, listening to tapes in their car, has enabled them not to double but to triple their income, and not in 90 days but in 30 days. Because most people don't read. Most people don't learn. When you begin to read and learn and become excellent in your field, you begin to move out of the pack very, very rapidly. Remember, every excellent performance reinforces your self-esteem. It improves your self-image. It builds your self-confidence and improves your performance in every other area. Every single time you do something in an excellent way, it makes you feel great about yourself. But if you only do things in an average way, you don't get anything. You don't get any feeling of satisfaction. You don't get any burst of enthusiasm. You don't get any extra self-esteem. So always go the extra distance. Always do that little bit more that makes the job perfect. And it's completing that job perfectly that gives you that wonderful feeling of competence and mastery in the country. And they asked him why it was that he was able to start with no experience or background in the industry and become the top in just six months. And he said, well, I don't know really. He said, but there's one thing that I do every day that I think has helped me. And he said, every day when I get in the car for the first 10 or 15 minutes, as I'm driving to my first appointment, I say over and over again, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. And I found that if you say over and over again, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best, repeat it over and over again, it drives it down into the subconscious mind and it causes you to perform better than sometimes you can imagine. So make the decision, visualize, affirm, repeat over and over again, visualize, see yourself as the very best in your field and think about how you would look, what you would be, what qualities and attributes you would have, who you'd be working with, how you would dress, how you would walk and so on. If you'll do that, there's nothing that can stop you from going to the top in your field. Do something every day to improve. Study your performance. Review and reflect on what you're doing and what you would do differently. Here's the two best questions I've ever learned for achieving excellence. After every performance, after every situation, after every time you have engaged in an act in your work, step back and ask yourself, what did I do right? And review your performance. Say, what did I do right? And if possible, write it down. And number two, ask yourself, what would I do differently? How could I improve it next time? You see, if you review what you did right, and if you think about what you would do differently, as you review and reiterate these points, you drive them into the subconscious. They go into your programming so that the next time you're in the identical situation, your subconscious mind, looking out through your eyes, will say, I've been here before, and here's the right things to do. The big mistake, and the biggest mistake that you can possibly make, is to review what you did wrong. Because if you review what you did wrong, inevitably you will program that into the subconscious mind, and in the next similar situation, you will repeat the wrong performance. So always think about what you did right. Always think about how you would improve. And here is the key to peak performance. And this comes from the research into peak performance. Prior to every important experience or situation, take a few minutes to recall your previous excellent performance in this area and relive it in your mind and then go into the situation. Now, what is it that failures do? Failures also relive their performances, but before every important experience, what they do is they relive their failures. So be a peak performer. Be excellent. Strive for excellence and always review and think about your top performances. Think about yourself performing at your very best in every situation. Every time you review it, Every time you visualize it, every time you think about it, you drive that pattern of superior performance into the subconscious as a habit. Seek out advice from other people who are good at their work. Ask the top people in your field. Ask them for recommendations on books, 
tapes and courses. I have a good friend who is in the insurance industry, and when he went into the insurance industry, he made the decision that he was going to be good, and he worked hard, and he read books, and he took the courses, and he listened to tapes, and within a year, he was one of the top salesmen in his company, and he was sent to the National Convention. At the National Convention, they had the top salesmen in the whole nation, and the top salesmen came up on the stage, and they received prizes and awards, and it was pretty much the same people every year, and after the prize ceremony, he went to each of these top five or ten salespeople over the course of the two-day convention, and with a tape recorder, he said, could I have a few minutes of your time? And he sat down with them, and he interviewed them, and he asked them, what books do you read, and how did you become successful, and what courses do you take, and what recommendations could you give me if I want to be more successful in this industry? He said that they were very, very helpful. He was amazed. Not one of them turned him down. He got some of the best advice that he possibly could from these people. And he was amazed at a second point. He said they told him during the course of these interviews that even though they had been the top salesmen in the companies for years, nobody had ever sat down and asked them for their advice. That nobody had ever gone to them and said, could you help me to be more successful too? So seek out winners in your field and you'll be astonished. Winners will always help other people win. Winners will always give you advice and tell you what books to read and what tapes to listen to. So seek out the very best people in your field and say, I want to be good like you. What can I do? What can I change? How can I improve? What can I read? And they'll give you the advice. And then finally, never even consider the possibility of not achieving your goal of excellence. If anyone else has done it, so can you. And I'm not saying that to achieve excellence is easy. It's very difficult. It requires tremendous self-discipline. It requires tremendous work on yourself. It requires hours and hours of arduous effort late at night instead of watching television or having fun. It requires a tremendous commitment. But every single step that you make on the road to excellence and every single excellent performance that follows will build your self-esteem, make you feel terrific about yourself. It'll increase your income. It'll enhance your self-image and improve the overall quality of every area of your life. Commit yourself to excellence and get on that road to excellence and never stop until you achieve it. And one final point on excellence, remember that excellence is a journey. It is not a destination. That you never arrive at excellence. That the better you get, the more you realize how much more you can still improve. So you'll never arrive on it. Get onto that road and stay on that journey to excellence and stay on it for the rest of your career. And a final point, if you do not love your current job enough to want to be the best at it, then you must get out of it and get out of it as fast as you can because you'll never be successful and you'll never be happy unless you love your work enough to want to be the very best there is. Mm -hmm.